Is this what you meant when you wrote that every one of this country's primary institutions is anti-democratic, anti-democratic in spirit, design, and operation? It is. It That's is. a strong statement. I, every I, one I, of the country's primary institutions, yeah. meaning? Meaning educational institutions, large-scale educational institutions, meaning uh, institutions of government, bureaucratic institutions, major institutions of media and communication, major institutions of, an e of a st uh, recognizably economic kind as well, and I, would th and, and I think large cultural institutions too, again, something like, like the media. Is anti-democratic, meaning? Meaning that uh, two things, one hierarchical, they're all hierarchical structures, and hierarchy means inequality, means inequality of, of power. Secondly, I think they're fundamentally elitist in, in character, which is to say that each of them involves a definition of who should lead or control that institution based upon criteria which can only be met by a relatively few. So it becomes a way of excluding. And that means anti-democratic. You do it, not it, consult the people. You do not involve the people. You do not. And yet as you talk, I keep hearing the criticisms of the last uh, 10 or 15 years. I'm sure you remember them. There's been an excess of democracy, mm -hmm. critics said. We have too much democracy, mm -hmm. too much participation, growing in part out of the 1960s. Mm -hmm. now, isn't there a contradiction there? No, I think that the notion of there being too much democracy is, is, basically, uh, uh, is basically hogwash. Do we need a revolution? I think we need radical reconsideration of some fundamental assumptions, but I still believe that, the, uh, that violence and uh, older understandings of revolution are as anachronistic as perhaps New England town meetings, maybe, maybe more so. It just, it seems to me, the modern societies are, have reached such a fragility that the notion of overturn and uh, overthrow makes no sense except if one has an unlimited appetite for barbarism, which I don't happen to have, because we've got to deal with where, where we are at this point. And so consequently, I guess I'm driven ultimately back to questions of education and the possibilities of education in terms of helping to ease away our way into a better kind of world for, uh, for us as well, as well as others. What are the skills of citizenship and, and how do we gain them? How do we teach them? How do we appropriate them? I don't think we approach them by the way they're currently being approached. I'm a little suspicious of most tempor contemporary educational reform proposals because the business community is so enthusiastic about them and they can see, of course, a way in which public funds get used to create job training for, for, private, for private industry. But if you want to empower people, as you were talking, you, you obviously believe people need to be empowered. Mm -hmm. If you want to empower people to function in an economic order, don't you give them a vocational skill that they can go forth with and use to their advantage? To a degree. The question of what it means to be empowered, I think, is at, is at the heart of the whole issue of educational reform now. But it's being faced only as a job issue, not as a, as a question of what it means for students to be systematically deprived of the kind of knowledge, sensibility, understanding that can come from so-called soft subjects. Subjects like literature, or later on philosophy, or history, or some of the softer uh, social sciences. Now, those kind of subjects, I think, teach people not job skills, but they teach people how to interpret their experience, how to interpret what's happening to them. What's the meaning of this? What's the meaning of that? And what literature, history, philosophy, politics gives you a, an understanding of are relationships of power in ways that aren't handled by more scientific understandings, ways of, of, in which power relates to personal hopes, personal fears, vulnerabilities, and the rest of it. Now, those understandings, I think, without them, I think a person without them is, is really powerless. What are the questions you think we must ask as we move toward that rapidly approaching year 2000? The central question to me is the question of what I would call collective identity. That is, what do we think we want to stand for as a people? And that's what I think the democracy, the preoccupation with a democratic culture for me is all about. That what I think we want to stand for is not expansion of American power, not the 
uh, endless and economic and technological innovation that I think we're committed to, whether we want to be or not. But really, what is it we want to see ourselves identified with as a people? Do we want to see ourselves identified with notions of cooperation, notions of diversity, notions of respect and encouragement, of different kinds of sensibilities and different kinds of cultures, different kinds of, uh, of understandings of the world? Or do we want to see ourselves instead basically as the technological power of the world? Collective identity is something that the founders tried to deal with in the preamble to the Constitution where they mention certain kinds of, uh, of values. That, we uh, the people in order to. In order to, yes, and justice as part of it, and, uh, and, and, so, and so is defense, of course. But it's, 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 a, it's a first stab at a collective, uh, at an understanding of ourselves, and why we want to present ourselves to the world. Is it romantic to think that each of us, high and low, black and white, male and female, has an opportunity to contribute to the answer to that question? Oh, I think we do, because I think fundamentally democracy in a democratic culture comes down not to big highfalutin institutions or policies. It comes down ultimately to how we treat each other in our ordinary range of relationships and, and conversations. Mm -hmm.